Hi, Bonnie. Welcome. I'm really happy to have you here today. Thank you, Bob. Thanks I'm very sure. pleased to be here. Thank you. I'd love to hear a little bit about what you do and just kind of as an introduction, and we'll go different places in our conversation. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Well, I've been a therapist for about 20 years, mm -hmm. and my main interest has always been working with really severe abuse kinds of issues mm -hmm. and also attachment kinds of things. So here in uh, Orange County, I had a nonprofit for a number of years, and then in 2003, I met Dan Siegel mm -hmm. for the first time and heard him speak and was just electrified by hearing the neuroscientific foundation put underneath a lot of the things that we'd been doing. So then I got pretty obsessive and started to really dive in and was very fortunate to be in his study group for a number of years and, um, and have had some, some consultations with him and really, really trying to understand as deeply as possible how to apply this. So that's my main interest now is the application of interpersonal neurobiology to the practice of therapy, also to how we train therapists, um, also in education, uh, social policy. The wonderful thing about it is it's so broadly applicable. But uh, I've gotten really interested of late in, in very much in how this information might shape the young life of a, of a new, brand new therapist, yeah, both in school and then as moving into practice through supervision and all of that, because I think it has so much to say about, about what we could be doing differently. Mm -hmm. Just uh, in a nutshell, I realize it's kind of a million dollar question, but what <laughs> is neuroscience and, you know, uh, from your initial meeting with Dan Siegel on, what does it add to your understanding of what's going on in psychotherapy, and maybe we can talk about later in terms of, of um, uh, training as well, you know. But sure. just, 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 just for kind of the lay person just getting introduced to it, what does neuroscience add to, add to our understanding? Well, I think the main word that it happened for us, I, I was fortunate to bring this in, and I was training about 10 interns at the time, yeah. and so we got to work this through together for five years, and what I saw emerge was greater and greater clarity. Mm -hmm. The ability to really begin to understand what's going on inside a client's mind, especially when what they're bringing sounds irrational to yeah. our everyday perception, yeah. because people who've been really injured may be leading what we think of as beautiful lives, but they hate themselves, mm -hmm. and they feel like they should be killed or something, you know, mm -hmm. just it should be destroyed in some way. Mm -hmm. And to try to talk them out of it goes nowhere. Mm -hmm. And once you understand the neuroscience of it, you can see where this is coming from. You can literally begin to picture in your own, on your own mind and then hold them where they are, which then helps them begin to be able to move this. Mm -hmm. Because if you come in instead with, well, but you're really a wonderful person, that pushing against actually strengthens the neural nets of the problem. Mm -hmm. It strengthens the way it's wired in, mm -hmm. instead of opening a way for it to begin to move and to change. So we can begin to see these change processes mm -hmm. as they are right there in front of us. What, what is it that happens, Bonnie? You know, if, if I'm the client and you're the therapist and, you, and you're able to, you're able to see the kind of the multiple forces that are going on that lead to whatever's going on for me. What is it about you're being able to hold it? But you, you just talked about this. You're being able to kind of hold it as therapist. What is it about that that, that can make a difference for me amidst my confusion or my stuckness mm -hmm. or whatever the issue might be? Well, one of the things that happens is if there is this very calm, warm, and understanding space, not mm -hmm. just calm, because I think many therapists can have this kind of calm, openness. Yeah, have a mental picture of therapists and supervisors that may have been able to be that. Right. Yeah. But with the added dimension of understanding, there's a way that we resonate with each yeah. other so that the, so that you would begin to feel mm -hmm. felt, you'd begin to feel understood and heard. Mm -hmm. And we know now that that interaction between people actually begins to rewire circuits in the brain. Being understood. Deeply understood. Deeply understood. Not just understood in your words, but deeply understood as far as the roots and the origin of why you're feeling that way. And if I'm able to see that and, and, and just convey it, sometimes even without words, yes. it actually begins to wire certain circuits in the brain between the limbic region in the middle and up here in the prefrontal that begin to be able to be a calming influence, begin to reshape the nervous system and all of that. I definitely know the experience of being understood by someone, including you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I know that the felt experience of that, what's amazing is to, is to be able, maybe for the first time ever, to understand really what's going on neuronally 
and, and that it could be sustained beyond a momentary interaction. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more into that in terms of, what you, you talk about rewiring, I'm interested to know, I do know the calming experience in the moment, but right. I want to hear more about the, the kind of sustained impact that might have. Right, well, it, it, there's several different approaches to this, and some of them are a little technical probably for what we're doing okay. right this okay. minute. Okay. But in the big picture, what, what begins to happen is, is that where attention goes, so goes increased neural firing. Yes. So if we're able to pay attention to this calming, expansive, what we would call a regulating experience, mm -hmm. the more together we generate it and the more we attend to it, the stronger the synapses, the okay. synaptic strength becomes. Mm -hmm. And we may even be creating some new neurons, as it turns out, mm -hmm. because it's a new experience, actually brand new neurons that will integrate in that's the amazing. brain, which is amazing. And that's fairly new stuff, but yeah. it's really amazing yeah. that our brains do continue to, to do this throughout the lifespan. There's no, uh, there's no shelf life end date used by such and such a date on our stem cells. <laughs> they are, remain available for that kind of change throughout life. Because once they split, when a stem cell splits, the, the uh, mother cell remains and can split again, so they don't go away. That reverses some thinking that, that I was exposed to early on, for example, in graduates, mm -hmm. but for sure, and it's not that long ago, no. 25, 30 years ago, and this is a really different way of thinking of that, for sure. Uh, it's much more hopeful, for one thing, but it seems like right. it's rooted also in scientific uh, right. uh, observation. Yeah. Right, and we're such a scientific nation that when mm -hmm. it turns out there's some research that shows that if you even mention neuroscience, that people believe whatever you say next, even yeah. if it's ridiculous. And they believe it more if it's ridiculous than if it's not ridiculous. It's a very interesting piece of research. Help me understand the last point. What is it about? Is, is there something in the human psyche that's just oriented towards ridiculousness? Well, I don't think it's that. I think that it causes such a dissonance in us when something feels way out of kilter. And if okay. somebody says neuroscience, it's like, oh, well, then it must be true. Gotcha. So we can, it relieves that sense of dissonance yeah. inside of us yeah. even more than if neuroscience is paired with something that actually makes sense. Makes me think of Stanley, Stanley Milgram's work on obedience to authority. Yeah. If the authority happens to be neuroscience, it baptizes. Whatever you say after that must be true. <laughs> exactly. That's what's turned out to be true. So yeah. I think that means yeah. we have to be really responsible how we use our yeah. knowledge of neuroscience and that us being accurate yeah. in our descriptions and in our talk about yeah. it because it's going to have an impact. Yeah. Our presence will have an impact on our clients, but so does how we talk about this. So I'm, uh, one thing I learned from Dan Siegel is precision is very important and accuracy mm -hmm. and learning this stuff really well so that we're very clear in our own minds. And then that opens the door for the second half of I think the all-important equation of what the neuroscience does is that when we feel that stable and that grounded, mm -hmm. it opens the door to being able to just have abundant compassion that flows easily. Mm -hmm. And we don't get swamped by it because we still have a one foot very solidly and understanding objectively what's going on. And so it makes room for even more compassion because a lot of therapists burn out on compassion if that's what the only game in town for them. Mm -hmm. It's just too much. It just burns out the nervous system and makes them exhausted and all of that kind of thing. Yeah. It, 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 for me, we've made a transition into maybe looking at how this applies to therapists. I think earlier what you're saying, I was thinking of it more personally, but it all certainly applies to therapy in terms of the impact of empathy mm -hmm. being understood. Um, I want to come back to what you just said and, and, and try to understand it better around compassion and kind of mm -hmm. opening up the doors of that. And certainly I, I can remember supervisors I had very early on, 25, 30 years ago, that uh, my strongest hit on them is that they were burnt out. Mm -hmm. And of course as a young man it was very dismaying to me. I thought, is this my future? And uh, it mm -hmm. sounds like that that's not inevitable, especially mm -hmm. now that we've got a much more refined understanding of what's possible in the human brain and, and mind. Right. Can we just talk a little bit more into that, just kind of see where it leads in terms of expanding compassion and maybe also um, creating resources to battle burnout, because that's for sure. Right. My daughter Amanda has just started Tuesday, a social work program, ah. as I shared with you, I think, and, yes. and I know that that's a concern to her. She has a, um, an older faculty member, probably our age, who's teaching her, mm -hmm. and she's commenting on this with me, and I'm thinking, how does Amanda know that she's not going to be burnt out at whatever age? You know, so right. let's, let's talk a little bit about this. Yeah. Well, I think burnout is a kind of a multifaceted sort of thing. I think that having a lot of clarity about what's happening, so you're really resting on a firm foundation yeah. that's always your reference point, yeah. and that you probably don't even have to think about a lot anymore, yeah. because it's just how you see the world, yeah. gives you solid footing, yes. so that the compassion 
passion that goes out is rooted somewhere and it isn't just this flowing out endlessly mm -hmm. that just begins to rob you of energy and make you and also have you take stuff on mm -hmm. the other key point though is is that therapist mental health is really the whole mm -hmm. ball game is what neuroscience has, has shown I'm us really interested in you talking a little bit because <laughs> i know you'll be talking about it more today as well but just uh, right. maybe a word or two about that yeah. sure because because if, if I have some mm -hmm. old, unhealed memories inside of me, what we call implicit memories, these really deep patterns that are inside, mm -hmm. and then, but I don't know about them because these are all held mostly below conscious awareness till we work to make them conscious. Then I have a client who comes in and begins to touch my wound. Yeah. Not only can you get burnout around that, but I would say that almost all ethical violations are a result of these interlocking implicit memories where the therapist's implicit memory gets tapped into and then, and then instead of drawing the client into your healthier world, you begin to move into the client's world and begin to dance with the client. And all that does, of course, for the client is replicate mm -hmm. all of their life experience and it's tragic. Yeah, it and it's tragic for the therapist. Yeah. You know, I, I just, uh, so, so therapist mental health and how we nurture that in a program, in a training program, in not a haphazard way, but in a very intentional neuroscience-based way, to me is where we need to go next, has become the thing that I'm very interested in. Because I got bits and pieces of it in my own program. I went to Azusa Pacific, and one of the things we did was, it was a, it was a depth psychology program back at that time before cognitive behavioralism. You know, usurped all right. the programs in yes. America, pretty totally much. Related. I totally understand what you're saying. Though. But what one of the things we did was our last project yeah. was that we were to flesh out what our particular paradigm of therapy was. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't say, I'm going to be CBT or psychodynamic. It's what have I learned in this year as an intern, working with a client for at least a year, what have I learned about what makes therapy work? Mm -hmm. Man, that was the hardest thing I've done, and it was so helpful. It was so helpful because I felt like I graduated with my feet really on the ground. And fortunately, I was in my own therapy at the time and had been for a number of years, so I was getting that, getting my own inner world straightened around, and now I was getting this clarity without neuroscience. This is back in the 90s before. I mean, Dan Siegel's Developing Mind was 1999, and that was that and Alan Shore's work mm -hmm. in the very early 90s were kind of the beginning of yeah. all of this, yeah. Yeah. trying to make it relevant to yeah. therapy. Yeah. So I found that so helpful to have this conscious model coupled with my own work. Mm -hmm. And so as I moved out into being a therapist, I, I really can honestly say I, in all the years that I did it and, and carrying very... Uh, what some people would say ridiculously high caseloads of seeing 40 people a week, mostly abuse survivors and supervising 10 people, I would feel energized, yeah, not tired. That's proof of the pudding, isn't it? Yeah. It really is. And again, that's because I got all this wonderful support, both, but both this healing for myself so I could see my own inner world clearly and hold it in a more healed place. Nobody's ever completely healed, but in a more healed place. And then also having the support of having a very clear paradigm. Yeah. And then adding the neuroscience onto that in, the, in this decade yeah. has just proven to be amazing. And the benefits for our interns, they would go from being kind of scared and anxious and does this really work and how does it work, which is what we all as interns feel, could say this works because of this and I know what to do next or how to be next, you know, what's going on here. I remember years and years ago coming across some research that looked at the relationship between cognitive ambiguity and anxiety, felt mm, anxiety. Mm. I'm just thinking of the drain that is on, on us as therapists or in any persuasion, but right. as therapists. If I'm doing something and I have some kind of self-doubt about uh, uh -huh. uh, the efficacy of it or, or, or even why it might be working, if it's more random for me, that's always going to be a drag on the system, it seems like to me. Well, Whereas if you have a solid foundation that gives you uh -huh. speed and confidence and being able to kind of search out where to go next, what a difference, what a bonus that is. You know? Well, it, maybe it, it really is. Yeah. I, I think it is pretty yeah. much a necessity. Yeah. And, and now that we have, I mean, we, there's so much talk about evidence-based practice, yes, but yes. to me the real ground is yeah. how does this brain and yeah. mind work? Yeah. Yeah. And now that neuroscience is being able to tell us more yeah. about that, to me that's 
the evidence base that yeah. we want to build on. We yeah. have a reference point now for saying, well, if I do this, what's apt to be the consequence of yeah. that for, my, yeah. for the person I'm working with? And if I do this instead, or if I'm kind of this way in therapy, like, is confrontation a good idea? When is that going to be helpful, or when is that just going to run the sympathetic nervous system off the charts? And there are therapists that have confrontation as one of their main tools in their arsenal that maybe don't reflect on what's happening for the client as a result of doing that. Mm -hmm. And what kind of change do we really want to have happen here? I just had a flash. So. I just had a flash. And it, it matches my experience <laughs> in our conversations, but for sure. And see if I can express this. Is that I can remember in graduate school there being an appeal to the depth-oriented uh, mm -hmm. psychotherapies, you know, variations on psychoanalysis and so on. But that it was, um, it was, um, um, it was complicated for one thing, and it was phenomenological for another thing. It was experience, and mm -hmm. so it's hard to, it's hard to, to, it's hard to see an experience on the blackboard mm -hmm. or whatever. Right. Uh, but it still had appeal, and then the alternatives seemed to be these kind of highly rationalistic approaches. And I'll just leave it at that. Mostly that, left hemisphere yeah, based that, that kinds that of tend approaches. Tend to simplify things down, and that appeal to that part, that that mm -hmm. need inside. But also then it cut off so much of the complexity or the nuance of human experience. And half of the brain. And half of the brain, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Minor details. <laughs> and I was just thinking of something I appreciate so much about you, is that you hold, you know, it, it just came as you were talking about neuroscience and what's been possible with findings over these last uh, few decades and the work of people like Alan Shore and Dan Siegel and Stephen Porges and so on. There's a way mm -hmm. that you hold that with, um, I want to say, uh, what would it be? Uh, fallibility, not in the sense of doubting yourself, but just that it may be reversed tomorrow or certainly yes. will be expanded or oh, clarified absolutely. or elaborated. So there's something about, um, okay, hang on that, that piece for a second. The other thing that came to me was, was um, that there's a paradox. There's so many paradoxes in the human condition. Think of how many friends I've had that say, why do I want to do this, Bob, but I end up doing that? Or, um, why can't I just think myself into feeling this way or that way? Just the way that it mm -hmm. is to be a human being. And here, interestingly, is a way to clarify the complexity, uh, kind of held lightly. So there's something about all mm -hmm. of that is very mm -hmm. appealing. It, 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 matches, it matches the phenomenology that can't be sketched out so concretely on a blackboard. But there mm -hmm. is a logic. There's an inherent... Uh, right. um, um, uh, yeah, I just I say like an inner logic to this very very compelling it seems like to me and it will get clarified more and more over the years to come and There's something about that coming together. That wasn't possible 20 or 30 years no, ago for it, me. No, it wasn't And as much as I got really good therapy myself yes. and then was able to extend some of that it, it was like what it feels like now was like looking through the the the, the camera mm -hmm. and having a fuzzy image Yeah, yeah. and now yeah. it's been brought into focus. Yeah. So it makes for this much greater precision of how to be with. Yeah. Not always what to do, yeah. but even how to be with mm -hmm. someone to meet them where they really are. Yeah. So that that clarification has been really mm -hmm. powerful for me. Because I've always been more of a object relations, mm -hmm. depth, attachment, mm -hmm. do sand tray, mm -hmm. let's get in and get dirty <laughs> experience sort of girl. But this has really deepened yeah. the practice, and also yeah. just being able to talk about the yeah. brain with my clients yeah. helps them begin to be able to see their brain, and that's yeah. very regulating. Yeah. Yeah. So they'll come in and say, I have knots in my amygdala. Yes. Yeah. And it's like, great, you know, right where you are. And so we can then work on, you know, if they're not literal knots, but they can feel yeah. that balled up energy yeah. in the amygdala yeah. that's making them do something they don't intend to do. Right. So you, in the, uh, you were talking a little bit about how what we think we know one day may turn out to be very different the next day because the science is so new. We're just yeah. at the tip of the tip of the tip <laughs> of the iceberg. So there's this very interesting research about what's called the default network in the brain, which continues to integrate things outside our conscious awareness while we're literally being mindless. So mm -hmm. mindfulness is good, but it turns out mindlessness works pretty I well, like too. too. <laughs> yeah. so nothing, I'm practicing mindlessness. There you go, exactly. <laughs> so nothing goes wasted. Well, when I first ran into this research, was fairly recently, because there was a lot about it, they were initially thinking that this network only went on when we weren't focusing our attention. And then they began to look at the data a little differently. Another researcher did. And then it's like, well, no, this seems to be on like when people are going to sleep and maybe under anesthesia. And then a man named, I'm losing his first name, I think it's Michael Rakeley is his last name, R-A-I-C-H-L-E. 
and he recently had an article in uh, Scientific American about mm -hmm. this called The Brain's Dark Energy. Well, as they then really began to look into the data, what they discovered is the default network is on 24-7 except maybe in deep sleep and even when we're focusing our outer attention on something we only decrease its energy by about five percent so that makes a whole different picture of what's going on in our brains you know as we see this research unfold mm -hmm. so even with research where they had the data already they mm -hmm. don't we can't always we don't have the imagination always to look at what all the data means mm -hmm. and so this is constantly mm -hmm. shifting so this I think makes us very humble mm -hmm. so whenever mm -hmm. I speak you know I always know what I tell you today I may be coming back and saying mm -hmm. it's either a little different or a lot different at another time and yet mm -hmm. there are some things like like the importance of attachment and those kinds of things that are so proven so many six ways from Sunday at this point that they seem like really good foundations on which we can stand. But it's not that long ago. I can remember starting studying psychology like 35 years ago, going in the table of contents to an intro to book, mm -hmm. psych book thing. I'll look up love. It uh, wasn't there. I thought, well, I'll look it up in the index. There wasn't anything on love or creativity. I was interested in mm -hmm. art and music. Nothing on that. Right. It's not so long ago, yep. the influence of people like Bowlby and so on, that's really a much more recent phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Learned marriage and family therapy in the 80s, taught it. And uh, much of that has been reversed yeah, <laughs> in the last no. 20 years in terms of what's supposed to be effective with couples. What I was teaching wasn't effective. Right. But that was all that was available. So right. it really is reconstituting itself all the time. It is. I, I, I want to say again, I, I really appreciate your holding mm. the kind of the... the um, kind of the assurance uh, that, that neuroscience provides, I think along with a humility. There's something about that that really, that resonates. Yeah, <laughs> well, and it's very, very necessary that yeah. we have that, you know, because there's so much more as we refine technology and even yeah. as we study data we have now, and right. it turns out that it means something right, very like different said. than what we thought it did. Yeah. So yeah. it's really, it's an exciting time. Yeah, it is. And it's a sense. fun time yeah. and it's a playful time, yeah. but yeah. we can't take ourselves too seriously yeah. either. <laughs> um, really appreciate your being here today, mm. Bonnie. Thank My you. My pleasure. I really, really appreciate it. One of the things that we're wanting to do is to integrate um, the work that you're doing. I know that you have a, a workbook, I believe, coming out early next year. Mm -hmm. But to integrate um, this material as soon as we're able to into our graduate programs in service mm -hmm. of, of training and training the kind of integrity um, kind of across all systems that you're talking about. I was thinking of it today driving in is that we're in an environment here at Cal Southern that, that teaches so-called through distance education. Um, and maybe it's more on us than, than other mm -hmm. programs. But I, just, I, I was appreciating that the kind of the, the irony is that this is really getting inside the therapist's psyche mm -hmm. and experience and trying to um, uh, create a more, your topic is a more integrated mindful therapist mm -hmm. or a therapist mm -hmm. in training and really appreciate the resources mm. that you're bringing that we can do that. And maybe more so in an environment like this where it maybe be easier to miss it. Mm -hmm. uh, our our uh, therapists go out into practicum placements and into internships and so on, but if there's a way to shepherd them through the program that yes. provides exercises and monitoring and encouragement, modeling of the kind of depth that you're talking mm -hmm. about, rooted in science, I really, really... Um, feel good about that. I really appreciate you, <laughs> credit you for inspiring mm. us and being here today. I think this really lays the groundwork for, for a revitalization of our curriculum that um, will we'll follow out. So thank you. Well, it's very, very exciting for me. Thanks, Thanks so much Thanks for bringing Bonnie. me here. Thank you.